the, uh, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Vermont for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it seems to me that a lot of the momentum behind the efforts to hold an Article 5 convention is based in extreme frustration with our current uh, system. And I certainly understand that frustration with the, the democratic process and worries that our priorities often are not in the right place. And you know, I would just mention I'm extremely frustrated that we're on the brink of yet another government shutdown because of the demands of a minority uh, faction in Congress. And so we know that the blow everything up option doesn't work and it often hurts regular Americans the most. And I fear that an Article 5 convention is, is uncharted and, in fact, dangerous territory. And Mr. Spaulding, can you explain the worst case scenario for an Article 5 convention? The worst case scenario is that it completely puts all of our cherished constitutional rights and civil rights completely up for grabs and special corporate interests, the same corporate interests that are backing this effort right now uh, through the American Legislative Exchange Council and others uh, would choose the delegates, would write the rules, could even rewrite the ratification rules. We've heard about how it would take 38 states to ratify whatever comes out of this convention. Um, that is not, that, that, the last time there was a constitutional convention, the ratification rules in 1787 were rewritten uh, in, in such a way. So that's, that is, for me, not a safe backstop. You don't start a fire and hope that the fire department's gonna come and put it out, that the 38 states are gonna reject them. That could be rewritten. So you have special interest putting our civil rights up for grabs and completely tilting the favor, even, tilting uh, our founding charter even more in their favor and making those changes permanent. And that, that's my concern as well. Uh, the Constitution, as you well know, is, is a bulwark to preserve important rights and liberties, and especially for folks on the margin. If you think about uh, the attacks on the LGBTQ plus community right now across this country, um, would something like same-sex marriage be at risk? Uh, would it continue to be protected under the 14th Amendment? Can we guarantee that if we were to hold a um, convention of the states? A absolutely not. I think all of those cherished rights, uh, marriage equality, the right to marry the person that you love, climate justice, racial justice, all of these rights and freedoms that we are pursuing and that we hold dear that uh, would all be up for grabs. Uh, those constitutional rights would be uh, at risk of a major rewrite. And the people that are backing yeah, tell me more about that. Uh, the folks let's, that, let's, let's just some that are out there. pushing um, some of these amendments mm -hmm. are, are quite hostile to the freedoms uh, that have been expanding throughout our history. Um, and that is one of the goals, is to constrain those uh, freedoms. And if you explore sort of where some of that money is coming from, some of the interests that are backing these proposals, um, it's dangerous. It's why 240 groups uh, have signed a statement opposing an Article 5 convention because it would, as Professor Tribe said, uh, put, our, put, all of our, put our Constitution up for grabs. Do you think it's fair to say that an Article 5 convention has the potential to follow unrepresentative processes and could result in some very undemocratic outcomes? A absolutely. Um, Again, the language is so spare. It just says that Congress is going to convene a convention, but it doesn't make clear whether people are going to be equally represented or whether states are going to be equally represented. So is it going to further empower um, states that represent uh, a small minority of this country, um, or is it going to empower people? How are delegates going to be chosen? And again, as I brought up in my opening statement, we're at a time of extreme gerrymandering. There are one group that is pushing this, the uh, Convention of States, it is their view, um, notwithstanding the text of the Constitution, that states would write those rules and that states would set the rules. It would be one state, one vote, and that state legislators would choose who's gonna go to this convention. I don't know where they're getting that from. That is not in the text of the Constitution. But all the more reason that this process would uh, not be nearly as democratic and people-powered as some are positing. I really appreciate that. In the last 30 seconds here, uh, I know a balanced budget amendment is something that sounds great in the abstract, um, but often makes no practical sense for, for a modern nation. Can you just speak briefly about um, your sense of what a balanced budget amendment could do to the economy? Uh, well, it would make it much more difficult to deal with economic crises, recessions, war, pandemics, 
uh, and it would harm uh, people in our country that depend um, on a government that is representing them and is meeting their meeting their needs. And so all of that, again, to put Congress in that kind of a straitjacket and then to tell unelected judges that they're going to interpret and rule on fiscal policy is not the way our system is designed. Thank you very much, Mr. Spalding. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. And uh, the chair, just for a moment, I ask unanimous consent that a statement from Americans for term limits on the history and utility of term limits be inserted in the